Thanks for checking out this movie review video. So this is for the 1969 Italian giallo film, So Sweet, So Perverse, which this is the second installment that Umberto Lenzi did of uh, a trilogy of films. The first one was Orgasmo, or as it was known in the United States, Paranoia. This is the second installment of that trilogy. And then there's the third, which is A Quiet Place to Kill, which I've heard is supposed to be the best of them. Now, I haven't figured out well, okay, I have a theory on maybe what the theme is for the trilogy, and maybe it's crappy rich people. <laughs> um, you can let me know in the comments if I'm right about that or not, if you've seen all three of them, but I'll, I'll have more of an idea after I watch A, play, a Quiet Place to Kill, that is. Now, this is in the uh, Severin box set of Lindsay Baker uh, for the four films that Umberto Lindsay worked with Carol Baker. And I will say, um, this is my second time seeing any of Carol Baker, Baker's work. And I like her acting. I really do. Even though in this film, they actually dubbed over her voice with someone else's voice, which is weird because she was delivering her lines in English and then they dubbed over her voice with another person speaking English. I don't understand, but whatever. Uh, but anyway, let's get into this. So sweet, so perverse, which by the way, the title, I'm kind of like, I don't, I don't know that it needed to be that racy in the title because like, yes, there's some nudity in it, but it's not an insane amount of nudity and it's not really all about the sex either. So don't really get the title as much. Maybe it's just like more lurid, so therefore more people would want to check it out. I mean, that's that's my best guess on that. So directed by Umberto Lenzi, like I said, um, and he's done other films, directed other films, such as Blood, uh, Seven Bloodstained Orchids, which I have a review for at the moment on my channel, uh, Orgasmo slash Paranoia, which I also have a review for, a Quiet Place to Kill, which I will. Knife of Ice, which I also will. And then I hope to get to these other ones. Spasmo, Eyeball, Eaten Alive, Cannibal Faro, Ghost House, and Hitcher in the Dark. That's just some of what he's done. That's not all of what he's done. So the script for this was written by Ernesto Gastaldi. Now, Gastaldi's worked on a bunch of Giallo films doing scripts. So I had very high hopes for this for that reason. And it is a pretty good script. He's done scripts for The Vampire and the Ballerina, Werewolf in a Girl's Dormitory. I always think that's a fun title. The Whip and the Body, that's a Bava film. Love Mario Bava. The Case of the Scorpion's Tale, uh, All the Colors of the Dark, The Case of the Bloody Iris, The Strange Vice of Mrs. Ward, Torso, The Suspicious Death of a Minor, The Scorpion with Two Tails, and the longest title of Giallo ever, your Vice is a Locked Room and Only I Have the Key, which I have a review for. Actually, I have a review for a bunch of those. If you don't know, on my channel, I have an entire playlist of just Giallo film reviews. And I'm, am I at like 30 at this point? I think I'm over 30 at this point. So I'm, I'm going to keep going. So uh, Riz Ortolani is the person who did the music for this film. And he did a ballad for it called Why. And if you watch the film or if you remember watching the film, if you've already watched it before... There's a song that repeats a few times. It is a ballad, you can tell, and it features Y in it. So you know what I'm talking about. This was actually reused for the film Seven Bloodstained Orchids, which I watched that before watching this, so I didn't, you know, see that. But when I did watch this and I knew that information, I was like, oh yeah, I think I kind of remember this from that film. So I see where it was used. So this was originally released in Italy and France only, and actually the filming of it was in Italy, France, and West Germany. So those were all those places. Um, all right, so getting into the actual events of the film. You get the idea something bad either did or is going to happen in the very beginning of this film, because that's when you see Jean driving his car on the road, and you're just like, oh, okay, well, this is kind of a normal opening, not much going on. And then they start showing his rifle, and that's when you're just like, mm, either something happened already and he's like going away from killing someone or this is setting it up to say, oh, something's going to happen. Someone's going to die. Well, I mean, it does foreshadow that someone's going to die, but, you know, you would assume that knowing it's a Giallo film. But uh, it's it's that kind of twist of you think something's bad happened or is about to happen, but it doesn't. And then you're just kind of like, oh, OK, he's just going to shoot some clay pigeons. But then he also has sex with someone who is not his wife. Uh, and I didn't, didn't even catch what her name was. I was looking at IMDb, and at first I thought that was his wife, Danielle, because she kind of looked like her. But then as it went further on, I'm like, oh, no, no, that wasn't her. 
So they kind of do that to set it up as establishing the relationship between Danielle and John very, very early. So we see that it's contentious. He's cheating on her, but she knows about it, which is weird. You know, the part where he comes home and he's basically like, they have that exchange where, you know, he's kind of like lovey and more like, I guess, worked up sexually. Uh, and, and she's kind of like, oh, what's got you all hot? And he's just like, oh, well, I'm not getting it here. So you get that exchange that really sets up that there's a problem there. And then later on you learn that, you know, they kind of, kind of have an open marriage situation, but I don't think she's having sex with anyone. And it's this thing where like, she acts like whatever about it. But then when she's, when he's away and she knows that that's what he's up to, then she's like crying in bed that we end up seeing. And so... It's this thing where she's trying to play it off like, okay, you know, this is what it is, uh, and you're just going to go out and be with all these women and have mistresses, and I'm fine with it. Like, I could care less. But she actually does. It actually hurts her. And that's why you find out in the end that, you know, she tried to have him killed because she's just like, well, so unhappy in this marriage. Why don't I just off this guy and just take his money, basically? But that doesn't work out, obviously. But we'll talk more about that in a minute. I did like the slick transition going from Jean uh, and the brunette at the shooting club, uh, shooting at the clay pigeons, and then immediately going to like post-coital bedtime where they're just kind of like hanging out in bed after obviously they had sex. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so I, I, I thought the transition was good. I, I don't mean that I thought that I love that topic. I just the transition was was well done. And in the in general, like Lindsay, what I've noticed with you know this is my third film of his now, I've noticed that he has a lot of movement with the camera. He doesn't like the camera to like sit stationary for very long, so there are lots of movements. Whether it's actually like following a character somewhere or just kind of like doing rotations around a character, and that's something that I feel like Mario Baba did a lot of that. And I don't know if that's where Lindsay got inspiration for that because obviously in the film industry no matter what country you're in or what time period it is people take inspiration from those that come before them so yeah so i and i believe i do believe that baba was in the industry before uh Lindsay was the way jean looks at the jewelry he found in the elevator conveys conveys this longing intrigue that's coming from jean kind of letting you know where his head's at uh, he even pays attention to the noises of the woman in the apartment above him so I, I think those were done really well to really drive home how he's looking for more women to be with. Like, he just finds a piece of jewelry in this elevator at his apartment complex, and is just like, oh, this, you know, this belongs to a woman. Maybe I can give it to her and then bang her, basically, is basically how he is. And then that starts his intrigue, and it just keeps his mind going down this path. So much so that he's distracted when he's in his own apartment and just hearing things up above. He's just like, oh, I think that's that woman. And he's just like, you see his brain just going and just wondering about what a relationship with her might be. And obviously that ends up happening, but it doesn't end up going the way he would like it to. I like how Nicole finds Jean in her apartment and he's so casual about how he broke in. Uh, Nicole's response is also not normal either. It was just this very like, he gets caught, and then he's basically like, oh, hey, sorry I'm prowling in your house. Sorry I broke in. And, but he's just, like, not sorry, obviously, by the way he's acting. And then she doesn't really properly react to it. But that can be accounted for, because much later you find out that, you know, she was in on this plan to get rid of him anyway, and part of her job was to seduce him. So, you know, it, it was... Things were going well because he broke into her apartment. So she was fine with that. Although I do think if she didn't want, you know, any sort of suspicion, although he was pretty dense, she should have played it off like, oh my God, why are you in my apartment? But yeah, it's just one of those things. But it also adds to the quirk of the film. It's, it's a quirky thing. I like how Jean leaves Danielle at the store to follow Nicole when he's dropping her off in the car and she goes into the store and then he sees... Nicole walking on the street and he just like takes off after her follows her and then he never goes back for Danielle so I I mean maybe he just dropped her off at a place that was close to where they lived but 
I feel like it was so weird that like he would go drop her off somewhere and then just be like, eh, whatever. Or maybe that was just showing how much he doesn't care about his wife anymore. Because obviously that's kind of set up in the beginning with their kind of terse exchange that they have. Nicole's flashback montage about Klaus looks cool and it's very effective in telling the backstory of her and Klaus and, you know, from a visual standpoint without having to actually put words to it. So I think that was very effective. I think it looked good. It was very well done. But looking back, when you know the end of the film, I guess her relationship with Klaus is real because everything get, kind of gets thrown into question at the end when you realize that it was all set up to try and kill Jean and get the money. Well, what purpose does that montage serve then? I mean, at the time when you're watching it and you don't know how it's going to end, you think that she's you know, going through this flashback of having this tra traumatic um, situation with Klaus. Um, but then at the end, you're like, well, was that fake? But I guess it could have still been real. You know, her relationship with Klaus then is just kind of in question. It's kind of like, what is her actual relationship with Klaus? And I think that based off the way she acts in the, in the end and how the kind of power dynamics in her relationship with Klaus shift... I think that that montage was real. Like, it was supposed to be real in the context of the film. Not, you know, a, a setup just for the story. There's a co component of trauma and Nicole trying to leave it behind by being intimate with Jean. But then she also says a part uh, about how she gets excited because of Klaus's abuse toward her. Toward her. So that kind of gives you an idea that you know, she keeps going back to Klaus because, you know, she just can't help herself because she hates being with him. But there's this little portion of her that gets excited by the terrible things that he does to her. So, yeah. And I think that's kind of telegraphed when, you know, you have Jean uh, opening her kind of, I guess, boudoir or whatever it is. And seeing that there are all these kind of like flogs and stuff like that that would indicate like s and type uh sex that she's having with klaus so there's a jealousy that stirs in danielle when she realizes jean is getting close with nicole uh this speaks to taking what you have for granted until it's at risk and not getting and not being there anymore now i say that and that's how it kind of plays but then when you go further on you realize that maybe she's just always felt that way and she's just been trying to put on a facade the whole time to just act like everything's fine you know to the out outside world she was probably just being like oh we're happily married me and me and john but then to him she's also putting on a different mask and saying you know i could care less you go be and be with wh whatever woman you want i don't even really love you anymore we're just in this just for the marriage so Nicole telling John that Klaus made her lure him in is a good twist, but you get the feeling that's only part of what's going on, which ended up being true. Like Nicole said before, she likes what Klaus does to her. She does set this thing up of letting you know that she is not all that she seems because who she appears to be initially then changes pretty quickly by her own admission. And she keeps saying, oh, Klaus will always come back. Klaus will always come back, so... I think that's also an indicator that there, there's much more at play here. The kiss between John and Nicole at the party is unbelievably flat. That was a very unsexy, unpassionate kiss. Uh, and it goes on way too long. That's another thing. For a, a large portion of it, they, it was like they just had their lips just sitting there on, on one another. And like nothing was actually happening. I was just like, how unsexy this is. <laughs> I had a feeling Danielle was the one who wanted John dead. I did see that coming. I did have a feeling on that one. Because once it's revealed that there was going to be an attempt on his life, which actually Nicole tells Jean, which, you know, they kind of need to orchestrate things the way that they end up orchestrating them so that they can have the desired effect that they do at the end. When they made such a big point of Jean's body being unrecognizable because it was burned in the in the crash... Uh, I started to think he wasn't actually dead and he was in cahoots with Nicole and Klaus all along. Now that's great writing because that's what you're supposed to believe as an audience member. I thought I was seeing something in it 
that maybe I wasn't supposed to see, but actually it was the great writing by Gastaldi tricking me into thinking that John was still alive. Now, obviously, that's the story point going forward of tricking Danielle into then thinking that John is not dead. Because, and it, it's played very well, though, too, because it's not this situation where it's done outright. It's done in a very clever manner where they kind of just leave these small things around. Like, I actually wrote it down what it is. Like, uh, the cigarette case, they place his cigarette case at Klaus's when they go over, when Nicole and Daniel go over there. The rifle that ends up being found in the place that it's not supposed to be, uh, which was Jean's rifle. The shaver and the cigarette that is still lit, that uh, is the brand of Jean's, uh, that Danielle ends up finding in the bathroom at one point. And then Nicole's call to Klaus that Danielle over overhears which obviously she was just talking loud enough she, she would definitely overhear if she makes it sound suspicious like she's talking to jean but then she's like oh no i'm talking to klaus so there are all these kind of small things that would indicate to danielle and then kind of make her maybe feel like she's going crazy too that she would start pl putting together herself the idea that jean is still alive and she thinks she's clever she thinks she's seeing things she's not really supposed to see and she's putting it all together when actually they're just carefully laying out all these pieces so that she comes to that realization and thinks that she has to drop on them uh in a way and for, for how suspicious nicole um nicole so sorry for how suspicious of nicole danielle ends up getting in this she sure has no problem taking a random pill that she gives her that one scene where she actually starts to say that she kind of thinks that John is actually not dead and that there's something else going on. Uh, Nicole's response is basically like, here, calm down, take this pill. It'll, you know, like knock you out. And she's just like, okay. Like, like she, she doesn't even hesitate. So it's this weird thing where it's so disconnected from what's actually going on, how she reacts. That it's just like, okay, that's, that doesn't make any sense. But yeah, there's a few of those things. So Jean's ring and the apartment attendant hearing Danielle yelling his name before being shot was the setup to make people think Jean was still alive. And by people, I mean not necessarily the audience, people in the world inside the movie, in that story world. Uh, so because they, you know, that attendant, apartment attendant, hears her, you know, going crazy. Obviously someone's after her. Obviously she gets shot and she's yelling the name Jean before it happens, even though it's not, it's Klaus. Um, and that was basically all to make sure that Nicole could get the inheritance then, because then, the, you know, they end up offing Danielle because, yeah, got to get that money. And I like that that's the twist. I did not see that twist coming because obviously I started going down the path that was intended of thinking Jean was actually alive. I thought maybe he actually was showing up to shoot Danielle. So good writing in that sense. I like when Nicole tells Klaus she's innocent. She's basically putting him on notice that he does what she wants from then on. And that basically she's going, she can easily blackmail him. She has something over him because he's the one who actually committed the crimes. She was involved, but there's nothing that can prove that she was involved. The only thing is really Klaus's word. That's it. And if he was actually involved and that can actually be proven, no one's going to take his word, basically. So, yeah. And plus, who's going to take the word of some very suspicious-looking guy over this very beautiful, very innocent-seeming woman? Just saying. So I really love how that shift happens because early in the film, you get the idea that the, the power dynamic is obviously very much in favor of Klaus, so much so that he's basically abusing being abusive to Nicole and by the end of the film you have that one moment on the plane where it shifts based on what she says to him that basically things are going to be different and now she has the upper hand and she gets to call the shots and he will be submissive to her so you could look at it look at it as submissive dominant relationship in the beginning that switches who's submissive and who's dominant at the end so I do like that that cool switch Interiors and exteriors of buildings used in the film are gorgeous, and they make for wonderful eye candy. I do have to say, I love that aspect of it. it. looks very good. And the directing and cinematography, quite good. I'm a fan. 
I feel like this film is more slick and stylish than Orgasmo slash Paranoia was. Now, I think story-wise, I liked Orgasmo slash Paranoia more, just because it's so over the top, it's so crazy, it's so whacked out, and it's intense, and it moves faster. That's another thing. This one's relatively slow. Uh, but stylistically, I think this is way more stylish. I think the directing is better, the cinematography is better. Just saying. Lindsay uses a lot of shots that start with or transition to mirrors, looking at the reflections of characters, either starting there or ending the scene there. There are also a bunch of cool shots through things or that move around things with the character. One of the earliest ones that you end up seeing is when John's walking outside and he goes kind of around the front of the building and then the camera goes around the other side around a bunch of these bushes and kind of meets up with him on the other side of it as he's coming around. So there's a lot of that type of stuff where it will like move around objects but then there's also like shooting through things like towards the end there's some sort of like metal lattice type thing that that they shoot through to look at uh, people and then the other one was when Jean and Nicole are on that island getaway, um, just, I guess, to just, you know, have fun and have sex. Uh, and then a boat goes by and Nicole's like, oh my God, I think it's Klaus. So they kind of try and hide. There's a pan that goes over and then it shoots, th it's shooting through a like rock structure that shows the boat in the distance through it, which I think is, it looked great. It's cool. So I'm a fan of that type of stuff. The pacing of this film is a lot slower than Orgasmo, like I said. Uh, the score for this is good and actually more restrained than an Orgasmo. In Orgasmo, it is very in your face, it is very crazy, it is cacophonous, it's nuts. Uh, this, it's a lot more light, it's more restrained, it's not so in your face. Um, but I think the music then is matching the feel and the uh, content of the films properly so proper music use i like it and that's all i have to say because the last note i had was about that power dynamic shift which i think is awesome so overall you know it's not the best giallo film i've seen like i said you know i like orgasmo more but this is a solid film i think it's good i think i wanted it to be less slow though because it is pretty slow it doesn't move at the great clip that orgasmo does so i kind of hate the fact that i watch orgasmo first because it set me up to be like oh man i hope so sweet so perverse is just like that it's not it's pretty different so i'm now interested to see what a quiet place to kill will be like so yeah um so out of five stars with half stars in play i'm gonna give this three and a half stars i think i think i was between three and three and a half but i think it's good enough looks good enough story's good enough i'm gonna give it three and a half stars i enjoy this film it's a good one Anyway, I uh, would love to hear what you have to say about this film if you've seen it or just Giallo in general. Go ahead and put some comments down there. But do me a quick favor and hit that subscribe button. That is your best way to repay me if you like this video or any video you've ever seen on my channel. It's totally painless for you just hitting that subscribe button. Join my nerdy horror community because that's what I have the channel for. I want to grow this. I don't have people where I live that I can really get nerdy and deep into horror about uh, with, especially not with Giallo, because most people I know don't even know what that is. So uh, that's why I made this channel. I just want to be able to reach out to people, and let's talk in the comments. Let's get nerdy about horror in general. So I would appreciate that if you hit the subscribe button and also the notification bell, because then that way you'll know whenever I'm putting up a new review video or unboxing or haul video or any of that stuff. But regardless, I really do thank you for checking this out and spending your time doing this. And until next time, keep it brutal.